Meltdown. Part two of our investigation of the orgy of greed and recklessness that drove the world into financial collapse. Only now are the hard questions being asked. Only now are the key players being held to account. In this hour, how the financial tsunami swept the world. The renegade executive who nearly destroyed the global financial system. Nobody knew just how big a casino AIG was running. And the Treasury Secretary who bailed out his old friends. The biggest welfare check in history had been paid to Wall Street. Behind closed doors, world leaders are at each other's throats. The reaction of the Europeans is very aggressive, very accusatory. Iceland is stabbed in the back by an old ally. Meltdown, the secret history of the global financial collapse. Sometime during the night of September 17, 2008, the world financial system went into cardiac arrest. The failure of Lehman Brothers, the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history, had sent financial markets into a tailspin. The New York Stock Exchange had its biggest one-day drop since the 9-11 attack. Markets from London and Paris to Shanghai fell in lockstep. Russia suspended all trading. In an epidemic of fear, the world's major banks stopped lending money and accepting collateral from each other. The next morning, at precisely 10.15 a.m., President George W. Bush stepped out of the Oval Office to try and reassure the public. The American people are concerned about the situation in our financial markets. I've canceled my travel today to stay in Washington and consult with my economic advisors. Bush convened that emergency meeting in the White House Roosevelt Room. According to notes, U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson told the president that the United States was on the edge of a total financial meltdown. He said, if we don't act boldly, we could be in a depression deeper than the Great Depression. Paulson had also warned, this is the financial equivalent of war, and we're going to need wartime powers. There was a moment, I think, in this country where at least for several days, the de facto president of the United States actually was not President Bush, but it was an unelected gentleman from Wall Street named Hank Paulson. Over the last two years, Hank Paulson has been summoned before numerous congressional investigations of the meltdown. Everyone realizes that the ruthless former CEO of Goldman Sachs played the leading role, and everyone wants to know why he did what he did. He was supposed to be the main free enterpriser in the Bush administration, but he ended up overseeing the greatest government intervention in the economy since the Great Depression. All investigations go back to his key decision in September 2008, the decision to allow Lehman Brothers to fail. In the White House on that Monday, Hank Paulson seemed almost flippant about the catastrophic bankruptcy. Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you all had an enjoyable weekend. <laughs> yeah. He said that it was not the role of government to save private businesses. I never once considered that it was appropriate to put taxpayer money on the line with, with, with uh, in resolving Lehman Brothers. Not saving them is a little bit like saying, well, we're not going to put the fire out in your house because you caused the fire because you were smoking in bed. And the guy who leaves next door will say, well, that's great for me when my house goes too because you're trying to teach this guy a lesson. The Lehman failure had repercussions around the world. Millions of people would lose their life savings. Pension plans were decimated. French finance minister Christine Lagarde would play a key role in the crisis. Although she was a close friend of Hank Paulson, she publicly called his Lehman decision horrendous. You know, I told him practically the next morning of the decision. J'ai été à l'époque bien seul et parfois un peu critiqué. Je persiste à penser que euh, c'était une mauvaise décision. Soudain, l'ensemble des établissements bancaires ont compris que personne n'était à l'abri et que toute banque pouvait tomber. À ce moment-là, l'ensemble des banques ont considéré que toutes leurs contreparties étaient en risque, peut-être, et elles ont bloqué 
tous les circuits de financement. Donc le, le crédit a cessé de fonctionner à ce moment-là. The immediate impact came in London, where the Lehman Brothers UK office had to instantly shut down operations. A lot of Lehman's trading was done through its subsidiary in London, and every Friday it would send all its cash back to New York. So on the Monday morning in London, there was no cash. The holding company had gone into Chapter 11, and there wasn't a penny to pay the staff. And that was about the worst way you could possibly close a bank. And so you had these pictures of staff um, just leaving with boxes full of files. The uncertainty on day one was huge and very damaging. Excuse me, sir. How, how are you feeling? <laughs> how do you think? <laughs> so all of these investors, not just in Europe and Asia, but in the United States and everywhere, all of a sudden have no access to this cash, no access to any of these assets, and have to start selling down their own assets at fire sale prices. And they're getting margin calls. And it's uh, producing this sort of vicious circle. A and that was something that I don't think anybody, both among the regulators and even the Wall Street CEOs, appreciated was going to be the reaction. In international financial markets, there was rising panic. It began to look as if many other banks could follow Lehman into the abyss. There was great uncertainty, too, about where this was going to end. It was really gut-wrenching uncertainty, and that is hard to uh, accept. I mean, you deal with it, but you kind of go, where is the bottom here? Many governments blamed the United States. The, the U.S. authorities have not got a grip on this. They're, lose, they're losing control, and I think you saw that in the trade credit. Suddenly, it was impossible to get trade credit, and literally from that week, you see this dramatic downturn in world trade. And, of course, we were hit by that. We're a trading country, so the collateral damage was huge. All eyes turned to Hank Paulson to see what the U.S. government would do next. He was not always clear about his intentions. He, he, I don't know if you, if you, if you read it yet, but we, there, there was, we, we had said that we, uh, we want... He's not very articulate. He has a hard time explaining what he's doing. He seems to be very impulsive. He's constantly on the phone barking orders. He's impatient. He drives his people very hard. He understands very quickly how severe the financial problems are. But I think he muddles the message in ways that may make it worse, because it's very confusing. He says one thing and does another, and then he changes his mind again. Paulson's ability to reverse directions came to the fore in the next crisis he confronted, the near collapse of the world's biggest insurance company, AIG. It emerged that the dealings of one obscure executive at AIG threatened the entire world financial system. His name was Joseph Cassano. Cassano lived in the most exclusive neighborhood in London, England. Every morning at 7 a.m., the 53-year-old American executive would hop on his bicycle for the short trip to the office. He may have dressed like a bike messenger, but in fact, he was the head of the financial products division of AIG. He had moved to London because the kind of trading he did was banned in the United States. Cassano would insure companies against the failure of their business partners. It was a very risky thing to do. But in conference calls with investors, he claimed that it was a no-lose proposition. It's hard for us, with, and with, without being flippant, to even see a scenario that would see us losing $1 in any of those transactions. Joseph Cassano's bet was that a lot of banks and mortgage companies around the world could never fail all at once. Of course, the downside was that if for any reason those products started to misperform, if the housing market crashed in a way that people hadn't seen in living memory, then of course AIG would face a very big bill. But Cassano, like many traders, didn't worry too much about that. And the terrible truth was that inside AIG, very few people other than Cassano himself and his particular unit had any idea what AIG financial products was up to. In September 2008, when many banks around the world began collapsing, 
Fasano's risky insurance scheme pushed AIG to the edge of bankruptcy. Hank Paulson was quick to deny that he had any intention of stepping in to save AIG. The truth was that the company's desperate financial situation came as a complete shock to the Treasury Secretary and all regulatory agencies in the United States. Total surprise, uh, which is a complete indictment of the financial regulatory system. How can you be surprised by something that is so big and so dangerous that if it gets in trouble, you have to spend hundreds of billions of taxpayers' money to put it out of its misery? Nobody knew just how big a casino AIG was running. Reality was that AIG was such a monstrous creature with tentacles in so many parts of the financial system that if you had let AIG go down, you really would have been risking dragging the wider Western financial system with it. In the end, Paulson bowed to the inevitable and saved AIG with $85 billion of taxpayer money. Well, I think there was this sense of shock that AIG was being saved. I think also a sense of relief. I, I do think that at that point, people didn't realize how bad things really were, but thought that, boy, if AIG went, we would be in a lot more trouble. Can I ask you a question, please? Joseph Cassano was fired by AIG. But he walked away with $315 million. Sorry, we have no comment. Thank you. On Thursday, September 18th, U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson went to ask congressional leaders for more powers and several hundred billion dollars to staunch the bleeding. The meeting took place in the office of the most powerful woman on Capitol Hill, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Good evening. I'm very pleased to welcome the Democratic and Republican leadership of the House and Senate, as well as the... Bernanke speaks first. And, you know, Fed chairmen are usually kind of careful about predicting doom and gloom because if they say they're going to be showers, everybody assumes it's going to be a hurricane. And he comes in and says, it's going to be a hurricane. He says that if you don't put some money up, taxpayer money to bail out the financial system, we'll have another Great Depression. And most of the members of Congress there are just completely stunned. Harry Reid, the majority leader, the senator from Nevada, says to him, well, how long do we have? And Bernanke says, a couple of days. And Harry Reid says, the Senate of the United States does not flush a toilet in a couple of days. They really thought they were staring at the economic abyss. That's what was in front of them. And, you know, we focus so much on Lehman Brothers and AIG, but it was those next dominoes. It was Morgan Stanley going. It was Goldman Sachs going next. And go after that, we were talking about General Electric, an American icon. Hank Paulson's telephone logs show that he was receiving calls from the head of almost every major corporation in America. Many of them, like Jeffrey Immelt of General Electric, worried that bankruptcy was just around the corner. Paulson realized that he had to pump government money into the financial system to allow banks to resume lending to consumers and to each other. He came up with a plan called TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. The government would strengthen U.S. banks using taxpayer money to buy their questionable assets. We gotta get this up to the hill quicker. We gotta keep it simple, very simple. The proposal was not well received. Hank Paulson, who wasn't very good at dealing with Congress at the best of times, turned up with a very thin um, proposal of a similar kind to recapitalize the banks, but it wasn't well prepared. It was only 10 pages long, whereas most bills in Congress are seven or 800 pages long. There was no account about how the money would spend, and Congress turned down the plan. They didn't like it. You see, what has been holding up the deal... Ohio Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur voted against the bailout. I saw it as a means for Wall Street to take a very gun-shy Congress a few weeks before election and strike the fear of God into them and get anything you wanted out of them and essentially transfer all of the losses that they knew were happening to the public sector. No, Mr. Paulson, we're not going to do what you're asking us to do. The vote did not turn out as Hank Paulson expected. On this vote, the yeas are 205, the nays are 228. The motion is not adopted. 
The bailout package was defeated today. Stocks fell off a cliff, the largest single point drop in history. In the end, 12... Well, they were horrified. They thought that they had made the case that we were on the cusp of another Great Depression, and they couldn't believe that Congress wouldn't approve the money. They were stunned. Um, and it was, it made the crisis worse because it made everybody wonder whether our political system had its act together. Hank Paulson said he never felt worse than when his proposal was voted down, and he began to show it. One of the sort of physical reactions he has is he does these sort of dry heaves. It's sort of almost a nervous, uh, emotional, tired, it, it, it's his form of sickness, if you will. There's a moment when he goes to the Hill. He's trying to convince all these congressional members to pass TARP. And that evening, you know, they, they bring him a trash can and they, they say, do we, should we get the, you know, the congressional doctor to come? And he says, no, no, this, this happens to be a lot. Paulson's international colleagues could see that he was under enormous pressure. Il a été euh, sous des moments de stress exceptionnels, sans aucun doute. J'ai le souvenir précis d'une conversation téléphonique que je souhaitais avoir avec lui sur AIG et, et où il m'a dit euh, « je prends ton appel mais j'ai 15 secondes ». Et je, je veux bien le croire, on était dans des, dans des, dans des périodes de, 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 de temps extraordinairement courts pour des enjeux énormes. Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson warned congressional leaders that if they did not get sweeping new powers and $700 billion, there was a serious chance of another Great Depression. In the end, they got the powers and the money, but the signs of depression started appearing anyway. In the last few months of 2008, signs of economic depression appeared in many parts of the United States. There were over one million home foreclosures, the greatest share in California. Two years later, the foreclosure rate is still increasing. What he, do, what he doesn't get right now, he can get from... Deputy Mark Haybaker of the Sacramento Sheriff's Department used to enforce only one or two foreclosures a month. Now he has 20 to 30 a week. The owner here had poor health and no insurance, and so lost everything. We love you folks. All right, you all right. Good. take care. Don't move to California, that's all I got to say. Construction worker John Kesnick is helping the family move out on the foreclosure deadline, piling their belongings onto the sidewalk. He too has been out of work for months. Hey, there's no one's, no one's buying any houses. Hmm. What's happening to the California dream? Yeah, okay. It used to be good here. There ain't no more. Sheriff Haybaker has one of the toughest jobs in the state. He often has to forcibly remove people and sometimes even has to draw his weapon. He is haunted by the case of one older man who was not going to listen to reason. Hello? Sheriff! He continually called the bank and made threats to them. The bank made me uh, aware of this. I showed up with another officer. Um, we approached the house and made entry into the house. And when we did, he, he shot himself, committed suicide. The living room was dark. He was sitting in the living room on a couch. Um, didn't leave a note for us, didn't leave any explanation at all. And um, he did pass away uh, the day after that. His family had probably lived there his whole life, and the bank took his house, and he probably felt that he had nowhere else to go. After being foreclosed, many former homeowners have no place to go and fall into despair. Some have to sleep in their cars. Single mothers Nicole O'Connor and Audrey Shrivener have just found places in the St. John's Women's Shelter in Sacramento. Both had been living in their cars for weeks with their children. Audrey has also been battling cancer. I've been working since I was 15, so you know, I have a lot of history, but physically I'm just not up to it, you know, right now. And so for the months before I came here, me and the two kids were living out of my van. 
Yeah, and that's scary. Not many places you could park a car overnight. Being a woman you gotta, by you yourself. You know, you've got security yeah. running around going, uh, you're not supposed to park here. It's like, well, where are you supposed to go? And you know, you're a single woman pregnant, seven months pregnant, and you're like, where do I go? Where do I go? I'm not, I don't, I'm not used to living on the street. Because I didn't know where to turn. You just cry. You're in a small, you know, small van, and you just want to cry all night, and you just, you just don't know where to turn. Under government pressure, California banks and mortgage companies hold events like this one in San Diego. Homeowners facing foreclosure are offered one last chance. They line up to talk one more time with bank officials, but there is little room for negotiation. It is exasperating for homeowners like Jack, who did not wish to provide his last name. They don't do any favors for anybody. It's all about money. They don't care about people. They can send them home, make them homeless, put them in the street. They don't care if they're el elderly, disabled, people who lost their jobs or had a health condition or mental health condition. They could care less. They could care less. That's, it's only in America. Rob or feed the rich. That's how it is in America. The actions of banks during the financial crisis raised the ire of many U.S. politicians. They don't return your phone call or they put you through so many hoops that you, you get so confused that you just give up. And that's the whole idea, wear you out. Make it confusing, make it very intimidating, and you'll walk away. And then someone else ends up owning that property, not you. So you've lost everything that you've invested in. It's a gentle lady from Ohio rise. Marcy Kaptur went to the U.S. House of Representatives and told Americans to fight back against foreclosures, even by resisting the sheriffs. What I'm telling people right now is stay in your homes. If the American people, anybody out there is being foreclosed, don't leave. You'll be squatters in your own homes. Don't you leave. In Ohio and Michigan and Indiana and Illinois and all these other places where our people are being treated like chattel. I would venture to say well over 75% of the people that get these notices from lending institutions have no clue about how to defend their own interests legally. It is just, it's a tragedy. On Monday, October 13th, 2008, as the U.S. economy was spiraling downwards, America's top bank CEOs were summoned to an emergency meeting at the U.S. Treasury Building in Washington. News cameras caught fleeting images of the arrival of Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan and Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs, John Thane of Merrill Lynch, and John Mack of Morgan Stanley. It was a holiday weekend, and the purpose of the meeting was kept secret from the participants. I, uh, David, it's Hank. U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson had decided the time had come for radical action. He intended to launch a virtual government takeover of the U.S. banking system by making direct government investments in all major banks. He knew that many bankers would be reluctant to accept. Paulson has a problem, which is basically the government of the United States can't force the banks to take this taxpayer capital. Um, he wants them to take it because he wants to put capital into the weakest banks and he wants the financial system to have more capital because if it doesn't have more capital it's going to shrink and that's going to hurt us all. So he has to use his uh, forcefulness to make them feel like none of them have a choice. And he does. The bankers knew that if they accepted the money they would also have to accept a lot more government interference in the way they ran their businesses right down to the size of their bonuses something they desperately wished to avoid. In the end, each of the nine CEOs present signed a hastily drafted single sheet of paper. Ten billion dollars of government investment for Merrill Lynch. Ten billion for Goldman Sachs. Twenty-five billion dollars for J.P. Morgan. Two hundred and fifty billion in all. To Hank Paulson's own surprise, they capitulated much more quickly and easily than he ever imagined. Literally by four or five in the afternoon, it was done. Nice to sit there, buddy. Try not to steal any more money. The biggest welfare check in history had been paid to Wall Street. Hank Paulson may have had sound financial reasons for doing what he did, 
but he had no idea what the public reaction would be. Protesters filled the streets denouncing bailouts for billionaire bankers. Paulson is still under fire for his handling of the financial crisis. At congressional investigations, he is pressed about what exactly U.S. taxpayers got for their billions of dollars. Ohio's Marcy Kaptur is determined to hold him to account. Well, you know, I wish you'd gotten a better deal for the taxpayers. You sure, certainly got a good deal for a lot of your former clients. I think if you look at what the taxpayer is going to make on a number of these companies, it will have been good. But the biggest advantage to the taxpayer is what didn't happen and that we did not have a collapse. We did not have a double the number of foreclosures in Ohio. And oh, they're, they're uh, happening, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Paulson. <coughs> you, you ought to come and visit us in Ohio and see the results of your handiwork. Well, I know how terrible it is. I'm just telling you it would have been worse. That's your best argument. That's not good enough. You probably don't agree there was a crisis. I agree it was a crisis of your making for very, very The gentlewoman's long. time is expired. <laughs> The economic collapse of 2008 quickly spread to Europe, and so did the rage against bankers and politicians. The two years since the financial meltdown have been marked by constant violent protests overseas. Police have fought pitched battles with demonstrators in London, in Italy and in Lithuania. Protests in Greece began with farmers and quickly spread to civil service workers and students, all of whom are facing severe funding cuts because of the meltdown. From the very start, European governments stumbled in response to the turmoil. Conflicts first appeared at this meeting in Paris on October 4, 2008. Banks in Britain and France had already started to collapse, but Europe's leaders couldn't agree on what to do about it. France's Christine Lagarde had proposed a European rescue fund for troubled banks, but Germany's Angela Merkel wanted nothing to do with bailouts of any other country's financial problems. In a closed session at the summit, Merkel sternly told President Nicolas Sarkozy, Every country must clean up its own shit. Ironically, that very day, a German mortgage lender suddenly needed a massive government bailout. And it was Merkel who had to write the check. A French newspaper quoted Sarkozy's gloating. Merkel told me each to his own shit, and then she ends up in it. Maybe the meeting failed, but it was not my failure. It was Merkel's. She fell into her own trap. The whole affair was not a great advertisement for European unity. Mais c'est pas un drame. C'est pas d'aujourd'hui que l'on ignore qu'il y a une culture anglo-saxonne, qu que l'Allemagne a sa propre organisation hollandaire, et que les pays méditerranéens peuvent avoir d'autres idées. Tout le monde le sait. Et vous savez, l'Europe, c'est 27 pays souverains. Ce sont pas des provinces. Ce sont des pays avec leur souveraineté, leurs drapeaux, leurs hymnes nationaux, leurs histoires respectives qui ont souvent été en guerre les uns avec les autres. Et cette Union européenne qui est un véritable miracle euh, depuis sa constitution, euh, elle, elle, elle fonctionne de manière cohérente, consensuelle, cohésive. Euh, mais elle ne fonctionne pas comme un seul homme sous une fédération euh, comme pourraient fonctionner les États-Unis ou, ou le Canada par exemple. We now know that the only thing that really unified the European powers was anger at the United States. A tug of war played out behind closed doors when world finance ministers descended on Washington to confront the Americans in the first week of October 2008. That critical meeting was chaired by Hank Paulson. Hank started the meeting by saying, uh, you know, we're in a bad situation here. We have banks failing in the United States, banks failing in the United Kingdom. Uh, some of the regional banks in Germany had failed. It was unclear that the markets would even open on the Monday, and we better deal with this. And that's a sobering conversation. French Finance Minister Christine Lagarde admits anti-American feelings were running high. 
Ce qui est certain, c'est que les dérèglements financiers à partir d'un marché, le marché américain, et qui a son origine dans une bulle immobilière considérable, a déréglé l'ensemble des circuits financiers et a précipité l'ensemble de nos économies dans le monde en situation très difficile. The reaction of the Europeans is, uh, for the most part, is very aggressive, uh, very accusatory of the United States. You caused this because you let Lehman Brothers fail. I didn't think it was particularly useful. I mean, and I pointed out to some of my colleagues that these, a lot of the European banks were leveraged at 30 to 1 and 40 to 1, so they couldn't really be too critical of investment banks on Wall Street that were leveraged the same way. The G7 finance ministers met President Bush the next day at the White House. He acknowledged that the United States bore the chief responsibility for causing the crisis and promised that the U.S. would change its ways to help clean up the mess. The finance ministers left the White House with a new plan that was agreed to by all G20 finance ministers, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. So by Saturday night, everybody in the financial world that had anything to say in government or in the central banks had endorsed the plan. I think actually that's quite positive news in, in terms of, of world government. Former Canadian Prime Minister Paul Martin says world leaders were struggling with how the game of international finance had changed. The best example, I think, in many ways is, uh, you know, is this person buys a house uh, in California, pays twice as much as the, he can afford and twice as much as the house is worth on the basis that the, the value of the house is going up. He gets a subprime mortgage uh, and it defaults. And what happens as a result of his default, Asian markets cr crater and municipalities in northern Nor Norway are declaring bankruptcy. That is an interconnectedness which I don't think anybody fully understood. Far from the corridors of power, some countries were immediately devastated by the global financial collapse. Iceland was headed for bankruptcy and ruin. During the meltdown, the worst international dispute over money came between Britain and Iceland. Iceland flew higher and crashed harder than almost all other countries. In the boom years, Iceland had privatized its banks. The new owners embarked on a binge of questionable financial practices. Many Icelanders thought they had developed a world-beating new banking model. The global financial collapse would prove them wrong. Egil Helgesen is Iceland's most popular political broadcaster. Suddenly, a small country with no history of banking, no history of stock markets, thought that they knew best. Uh, even its own record from the Icelandic Chamber of Commerce saying, uh, of course, the Scandinavian countries cannot teach Iceland anything because we are cleverer than them. In the years leading up to the crisis, Icelandic banks opened operations in London and launched major ad campaigns to convince British citizens to deposit their money in high-interest Icelandic accounts. Credit cards, club cards, discount cards, frequent flyer cards, ridiculous! The actor John Cleese became a pitchman for the Kutzing Bank. So all you Icelanders have got this figured out. I say, right. Icesave was an internet deposit scheme run by Landisbank. Because Icesave's an online savings bank, completely gummy proof. Not quite. In October 2008, Iceland's banks quickly collapsed and had to be taken over by the government. Prime Minister Ger Harda went on national television to announce that the country was facing bankruptcy and ruin. So, Hatta Runverle, Oder Landsman. The UK government immediately demanded that Iceland guarantee British deposits in Icelandic bank accounts. Already facing bankruptcy, Iceland refused. British Prime Minister Gordon Brown was furious. 
that happened in Iceland is completely unacceptable. I, I've been in touch with the Icelandic uh, Prime Minister. I've said that this is effectively illegal action that they've uh, taken. Uh, we are freezing the assets of uh, Icelandic companies in the United Kingdom. Britain invoked its draconian anti-terrorism legislation and placed Iceland and Landesbank on its official list of proscribed organizations. Icelanders couldn't believe it. You have the Al-Qaeda, you have the Taliban, you have North Korea, and you have the uh, Landsbanki of Iceland, the Financial Ministry of Iceland, and the Central Bank of Iceland. So when you're on this list, you have no chance. So whatever credibility there's left, it's gone. Icelanders were very upset that Gordon Brown had categorized them as terrorists. Well, we, we basically think, think he's a bastard. We consider Britain a, a friendly country. The problem we got was um, that we understood the then Icelandic government to be saying to us that uh, the creditors outside Iceland weren't going to get anything, and you know we, we couldn't, we just couldn't sit back and allow that to happen. I think the the, the application of uh, of legislation that was intended to deal with terrorists against a friendly country, an old ally, NATO ally, uh, was absurd. This would never, never have been done uh, had they been dealing with a more powerful country than Iceland. Yeah, I think uh, there was nothing about bullying Iceland. I mean, Iceland had allowed these banks to develop and to ruin themselves and ruin the country. Things are clearly tough for our US and our global viewers, but look on the bright side, you could be in Iceland. The financial system there teetered on the brink of collapse today. The scale of the crisis, the government's taken out these four-page ads, reminding people to remember their loved ones, to think of their children. This is also sort of a, the end of the, an illusion that has sort of collapsed, because for a while, everybody thought that they would be living in a famously rich society where everybody was moving around money. And we have to sort of reinvent ourselves as a nation. The financial meltdown triggered an epidemic of unemployment around the world. Perhaps the most astonishing collapse was in China. The interconnectedness of the world economy became starkly apparent in late 2008 in China. Shaoxing is China's textile capital and was among the first places to be hit by the full impact of the global financial crisis. The story begins with Tao Shulong, the millionaire owner of this textile plant in Shaoxing. Tao's factory employed 4,000 workers in an industrial compound that covered the size of several football fields. Tao drove around town every day showing off his latest Mercedes, and he was widely seen here as an advertisement for the new China. Unfortunately, in the fall of 2008, international orders for clothing from Tao's factories dried up all at once. Foreign customers told him they couldn't even pay for the shipments he had already exported. Tao quickly became desperate. He had no cash reserves to pay his workers, and there was no way under Chinese law that he could file for bankruptcy protection from his creditors. And so late one night in October, Tao sold his Mercedes, burned the financial records of his companies, and disappeared into the night. Tao wasn't the only one. Dozens of Chinese factory owners did exactly the same thing. There was a wave of bankruptcies in the Chinese industrial sector in late 2008, and millions of Chinese workers were suddenly thrown onto the street. Many textile and toy factory workers were owed months of wages. 
We just want to be paid what we deserve, and we are not asking for anything that we do not deserve. The thing to remember about Chinese uh, industry and Chinese companies is that they're highly reactive and responsive. You think these are companies that can turn around a toy design and make it an export before Christmas, you know, sometimes in a matter of weeks, and they're the, exactly the same. When orders start falling off, they close very quickly, and there is sort of instant reaction to lack of profitability, which is fire all the workers. It's a, it's a very brutal form of capitalism. Someone got on the roof to jump, this woman says, but the police just said, go ahead. Other workers reveal they haven't eaten for two days. Han Dong Fang is a labor activist in Hong Kong who hosts a hotline radio show devoted to workers' rights. He says China's labor unions were of no help to the laid-off workers because those unions operate as virtual branches of the government. They never thought how to represent the workers, how to help the workers. So therefore, everything they react in a way that the workers don't really need. By Christmas 2008, there were an estimated 15 million unemployed workers in China. Thousands of factories had closed suddenly. Demonstrations broke out in several cities. Some police cars were overturned. Millions of angry workers demonstrating in the streets is about the worst nightmare for China's communist government. The interesting thing is that the Communist Party was extremely worried that that might happen. And it's always worried because it's legitimacy. The legitimacy of the Communist Party of China depends absolutely on delivering economic growth. And if you talk to Communist Party officials, they will admit that. They'll say, look, if we don't deliver economic growth, there's nothing else because we're clearly not really communist anymore ideologically. We have an essentially capitalist economy. And if we don't make it work, then we are the ones to blame and therefore we have to keep delivering economic growth. So they're very sensitive about any form of unrest. The 2008 demonstrations echoed the notorious Tiananmen uprisings of 1989, when Chinese citizens lost their fear of dictatorship and stood up to the communist government. Han Dong Fang was a leader of the Tiananmen protests, but speaking from experience, he urged workers not to participate in the violent demonstrations of 2008. One of the lessons I learned from 1989, the huge, massive street action, uh, looks powerful, yes, but uh, after the crackdown, everybody disappeared. We're human beings, and we have fear in front of machine guns. Even a million people in the street continue for three days uh, that power is not really reliable. The Chinese Communist government quickly suppressed the demonstrations there. But by the end of 2008, workers around the world joined the global protest against the economic devastation brought on by the financial meltdown. In Iceland, demonstrators pushed for the overthrow of the government. In France, some bosses were kidnapped and held hostage by angry employees. The victims of the crisis were fighting back. Next time on Meltdown. Out of work and out of patience, the newly unemployed aim their fury at the boss. While CEOs make do on less enormous salaries, 10 cities and soup kitchens are still growing. It's getting worse, and it could get a lot worse. Those who can least afford it are paying the price. Meltdown, next time on Doc Zone.